cruising around with Joey Nesbitt. I'll tell you more about Joey in just a few minutes, but uh, let's talk a little bit about fear. When I was a paratrooper and a parachute rigger in the Army between 1994 and 2000, I, I learned that uh, it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop. And I, I had this t-shirt that said, if at first you don't succeed, skydiving's not for you. Right now, we're headed to have lunch with Colonel Boland, and uh, he has a very interesting story that, that, that I, you just need to hear directly from his mouth. But nevertheless, I, I think I got over my fear of heights the first time I jumped out of a plane at Fort Benning, but it would be a lie if I didn't tell you that the jump master had, a, had to put a boot in my butt to get me out the door the first time. I, I had what they call a death grip on the static line. What's your biggest fear? Joey, what's your biggest fear? Claustrophobia. Claustrophobia? Fear of uh, confined spaces. Fear of confined spaces. You didn't tell me that before doing the tower work. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the tower work in just a minute. Uh, I'm reading this book, TED Talks, and I'm surprised by how many well-known people, celebrities, CEOs, you name it, are afraid of public speaking. I'm a public information officer. Joey is our assistant public information officer at the agency where we work. And uh, by training, we do that, that kind of work and we're prepared to, to speak to the public. Uh, it's, it's our full-time job, speaking to the public. So I, I've been on local and national news channels and especially following the hurricanes. Hurricane Matthew, Irma, Michael to an extent. Winter Storm Grayson was also a big deal as far as uh, impacts to the local community, so we had to speak on that. Uh, and and it's, it's comforting to hear from that TED book that, that we're not alone and other people also wrestle with that kind of thing, so that's interesting. Our local government agency has a YouTube channel where we post educational videos to basically inform our community on how our systems work and the different, different types of things that we do for the community as a, we're a water and sewer utility. Uh, about a month back, our production team sat down and we were talking about putting together a public education video about uh, how water pressure is maintained. And I'll put a link to that uh, to the to that video here, like I said, and check that out. Give us your, your feedback. Tell us what you think about that. I thought that the best way to get the point across about that video was to actually go to the top of an elevated storage tank. We went to the highest tank in our system, I believe. It's 180 feet. And uh, so, yeah, Joey, fear of confined spaces. That's kind of interesting, but uh, rather than just tell people, we said, hey, let's go to the top of this tower. So we climbed up 180 foot tall ladder, basically, to get to the top of that tower. And uh, to be honest, peer pressure is really what got me through that because because I, 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 I'll admit I was nervous. I was, I was, uh, I'm, out of, I'm out of shape, frankly. I, I haven't worked out in, in, in probably decades. Have you been to the gym lately? Here and there. Yeah, you Here felt like you went to the gym though after you climbed that tower. So rather than just using fancy B-roll to show what the top of a tower looks like, we actually went up to the top of the tower. Kind of cool, kind of scary, but we, we accomplished the mission. We got the job done. So I'm proud of how, how it turned out. Uh, please check it out and tell us what you think. Put, put some comments in uh, below or on that video if you go watch that on, on the videos page. Yes, so Colonel Tom Boland. You, you deserve an introduction. <laughs> and, and then of course the uh, the book, the book. The book. You were how old when you graduated Airborne School? Just shy of 57. Just shy of 57, 56. Four weeks, <laughs> Four weeks away. But you're still the, what's considered the oldest graduate of Airborne School? Uh, as far as I know. Yes, sir. I got a letter from Command Sergeant Major of the Army congratulating me for doing that and being well over 30 years older than just about everybody else. So. Yes, sir. <laughs> I was telling Joey I was 18 when I went through and uh, it killed me physically. Because... Uh, like the the first week uh what did it say ground week ground. tower week jump week yeah. so ground week is where uh, like folks that are runners think that the military is all about uh, about speed and and strength but it ends up being all about endurance yes and the 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 jogs are more or less kind of like a fast walk well they the hard part is you're doing a formation and uh they have several hundred people out there 
running and you get the accordion effect where you're the little guy on the end, you're running in and out, in and out. Just. Of course, as the book says, you had, you had already uh, spent 30 years on active duty by the time you reached airborne school. <laughs> pretty, pretty close. Uh, I had been in the Marines, enlisted in the Marines back during Vietnam time, and got out and then later got commissioned in the Army and um, with the Army Reserves. But I kept getting called up for uh, all kind of missions because I was started out in the infantry but moved to something called Civil Affairs. And we were the main support for the 18th Airborne Corps. So everything they did, we were their support. That way I went to Grenada, Panama, Haiti, and Desert Storm, and Honduras, and Egypt, and Bosnia. And Bosnia, I was a senior American representative to the British Army there, which was very interesting. I went to Benning, stayed at Benning, didn't go anywhere other than Benning. <laughs> <laughs> I had an uneventful, uh, for me it was a lot like being in a hat factory, just running up and down the 30 foot long table packing the parachutes all day. So uh, didn't get deployed, didn't have a hardship tour. Uh, it is what it is. I, I, I don't have anywhere near the, the field experience you have. Uh, and I guess so talking about that fear, when you were younger and you went into the military, you, you uh, uh, what the quote, and for instance, it's even on the back of the book. No fear, no sense means trouble for a private funny man. Why? I mean, what, what had you set up to, to go to Vietnam and, and uh, almost have a sense of peace? Well, of course, when I joined the Marines in 1962, there really wasn't much going on around the world. We weren't involved in Vietnam at that time. No, sir. And uh, I had actually had less than a year to do when Vietnam came out, but they gave everybody a four-month involuntary extension. If you had more than 90 days, you went. And uh, I never, never really thought about it. It was an adventure. I wasn't worried. Yeah. It, was really it, it was really the best thing that ever happened to me was getting into the Marines. Cause I have a form of dyslexia, and I, when I was a kid, I couldn't read hardly read at all and um, so in school they just back in those days you were just stupid and um, so I said okay so I was a class clown and a troublemaker and I'm always into something and uh, and when I got in the rings I said man if I'm stupid <laughs> some of these people are really hurting and uh, luckily I got stationed in California met this uh, girl who took me down had me tested uh, she worked at a college there and started going to school at night to, to and, uh, learn how to read and then got into uh, remedial math and English and that in, at night time after I got off the base and then just started reading. Read everything and got my hands on. Yes, sir. And uh, that took you to, well, you went to law school. You have a you have an MBA? I got a, a BA and a master's in urban planning, public administration, and then I have a law degree from the University of South Carolina. Yes, sir. So we need to get busy, Joey. Yeah. <laughs> I have a bachelor's. You have a bachelor's? Yeah, I have a bachelor's in social physics. But back to the fear question. Since we're talking about fear, Joey says that he's Joey's uh, afraid of confined spaces, and we had not talked about that before going up that tower. So we, we, we uh, two weeks ago, was it two weeks now? Was that last two weeks. week? Two weeks ago, we went up the, the Kate Road tank. We, we went 180 foot up the ladder, and then we got up on top, and then we, we filmed ourselves talking about how ele uh, elevated storage tanks build pressure and how that's maintained. And then the drone pulls off and shows us on, on the top of the, the tower. So uh, I know I overcame a fear of heights somewhat at airborne school. And uh, I was telling Joey that I was, I was kicked out of, of a C-130, my first jump. I had a, a jump master actually have to kick 
<laughs> kick me out. You know, and I can, I can, I don't remember exactly what he said because there was so much adrenaline going, but I could kind of hear the scream. Get your hand off the static line, soldier! You know, it's that kind of thing. Is, is that I had the death grip? <laughs> it was this hand. I remember. Uh, uh, was that something you were? Was that something you wrestled with? Did you have a fear of heights? Uh, uh, I had really. It was, it was a, an adventure to, to me. Game? But the first jump. I still was having a great time until I went out the door, and then when the adrenaline hits, it's like getting hit with a cattle prod, you know, a taser. The adrenaline just shoots through you. You're supposed to go 1,000, 2,000, all I got was the one. <laughs> and all I could think was, this is the dumbest thing you've ever done, you're fixing to die. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, and then there's a piece. The first jump is between, what, 200, 250? I don't recall. It, it wasn't that high. 125. 125. And uh, do you count to four seconds, and then it's not that long before you hit the ground and, and PLF, the parachute landing fall. You actually have to roll so you don't break your, your legs. But the uh, that that calm that hits you, and then when the when, when you start having higher and higher jumps, and you realize that you're okay, and I guess it's kind of like, look at you, girl, you're crazy, <laughs> building the. Uh, not confidence, the trust in the equipment. No. Well, I'm glad you packed a good parachute. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. I got a, appointed to be a head of a civil affairs team of the Special Operations Command at McGill Air Force Base, which is a central command for all the Middle East. And, of course, everybody there was airborne qualified but me. And I said, when they offered me the position, I said, well, I can't do that because I'm not airborne qualified. And they said, well, we don't care. We just want you to teach but what you know because you've been everywhere. And I said, I, I really want to go. Yes, so they, they made me take the PT test three months in a row. I had to qualify the same as the 17 to 21-year-old, and uh, which I did. And then I had to take a medical for uh, everything else. And then they finally said, okay, you can go. And if I'd known how hard it was going to be before I went, I might not have done it. I, I couldn't do it now at 43. And uh, uh, the Black Hats really worked me over. Uh, Black Hats are the instructors. And uh, so they enjoyed beating up the old colonel trying to make me quit. And uh, you know, one time I, we were doing the slide for life off the cable, and I hit the ground so hard all I saw was stars. I was laying there trying to catch my breath, and the black hat comes over and just leans over and says, quit, quit, you're just too old, too damn old. <laughs> and uh, so I got over on my hands and knees and crawled back to the line with all the young kids, and they picked me up. And I turned to him and said, I didn't come here to quit. And uh, so after that, they weren't so hard on me. <laughs> my my uncle Wayne Bennett, who I'll I'll ask to watch this video. He uh, he was a black hat during that period of time, and he got to pin my wings on. It wouldn't surprise me if if he was also a black hat when when you UPS. It wouldn't surprise me if, if Uncle Wayne was also a black hat when you went through, and, and he could very well be the one you're speaking of, but uh, he still skydives to this day. He lives down in New Smyrna Beach. It's a fun experience. Pretty exciting. After you do your five jumps, you do uh, one night jump. Oh, it went down. Which I think a lot of them were night because my eyes were closed most of the time <laughs> as they yelled on the way down. Uh, but my cherry jump, when I went back to my unit, and we go out to get there, the guys had taken my helmet and painted it red. And, uh, but the thing of the, the jump master is so important because the parachute I picked up and had put on and stand there and jump master came by and checked me out and then went off and a few minutes later he came back and he said turn around and I did and he said something just was not right 
and it turned out the parachute was not correctly packed. If I'd have jumped, I'd have probably got hurt. And uh, so I had to get another parachute. But, uh, that was quite an exciting uh, jump because you're all strictly on your own, man. There's no no instructors anywhere around you. You just you just go. You haven't given me the juicy oh. bit. What are you afraid of? Having to talk with food in your mouth. <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, I don't know if I got there yet. You're like, like an episode of House where there's a part of your brain that, that, that is turned off, the fear part. Colonel Boland is superhuman and uh, probably doesn't have the sense of fear that the rest of us mere mortals have. I know I'd fanboy on him just a little bit, but I think that Colonel Boland is awesome. Yeah. So I wish I had been able to serve on active duty under him, but alas, I did not. Nope. I mean, it takes a special kind of guy to go through airborne school at 57 years old. Yeah, so pretty cool. I know uh, he was probably a hero to a lot of folks that served with him in combat and such. Still, I have to acknowledge that I have some fear. There's some things I have to get over. Wrestling with it. These crazy kids. So, hopefully we don't have much to fear from the coronavirus. And uh, when we post this on Saturday, there's there hasn't been local school closings. But Things are shutting down all over the country, all over the state. So, anyhow, hopefully we have uh, no, no, no dramatic news to report. I hate to let her go. And we'll be able to just say hello next weekend. Bye. Yeah, you really do have a, you, you probably may be diagnosed one day with that, that rare medical disorder where you have no sense of fear. <laughs> I don't have that. Or, now, now going back decades though, were you the guy in college that was the, the hold my beard guy? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> have you jumped off a roof into a pool? <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> I think I can do better than that. Uh oh, here we go. Yeah, got some food. More in the Marines where you really can do stupid stuff. Yes, sir. We were on our way uh, to Vietnam and we was on an old aircraft carrier, World War II aircraft carrier. And we got in a typhoon, so me and my two buddies, uh, one of them were called Nito Jets and the other one Knucklehead Head. We went up to the very front of the ship just in the typhoon. So on the front of the aircraft carrier there was a little cable there. Just to hold it. So we were holding on to that and about to blow us off. So we decided we'd play a game. We'd jump up and see how far the typhoon can blow you. And uh, it was well over six foot, two hundred pounders. So no, he, he, he went to the service. Not to be outdone, Nito jumps higher and gets blown further. <laughs> Not to be outdone, I take my fuel jacket and open it up so I have a sail on <laughs> and jumped up. <laughs> and I was going so fast that I couldn't fall down. You know, the wind was just blowing. And I'm headed toward the side of the ship. If I'd have gone off, that would have been the end of it. You know? Luckily, I got up enough where I could fall and roll onto the uh, 
flight deck. And they both come over and pick me up and say, you win, you win. <laughs> so we decided we better get off the, out of the typhoon here. <laughs>